Hey Jazz, it's great to have you here today. How are you doing? I'm good, Mel. Lovely to see you on a Monday morning, not at work today. Yeah, yeah. You've got the day off today, have you? Absolutely. Monday's always my day to work on myself and work on my businesses and work on just life development. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, Jazz, I, I met Jazz a few months ago virtually. We've never met in person. Um, <laughs> where we both decided to become a facilitator for um, a program called the Ultimate Contribution and Covered. And um, so we've been on lots of webinars together and I've got to know Jazz a bit more. And Jazz is a very uh, well-educated, articulate uh, human being who doesn't, well, I've certainly seen in my short time of, of spending with Jazz, he's, he's not, he doesn't settle for second best in any stretch of the imagination. And I know a little bit about uh, Jazz. I know he's a property owner. I know that he's into marketing, obviously coaching. Mm. You're already a doctor. Um, lots and lots of things and uh, I thought you'd be great to get on Jazz uh, for uh, the listeners to hear your story you know how you sort of I guess you trained from an early age to be a doctor and then how mm. things sort of changed for you and what made you get into all the things that you you know you've got into so over to you. That's great Mel thank you so much for this opportunity to be here and to all the listeners I hope you are well and staying safe and staying sensible and that's the advice that's all I'm going to talk about in COVID today stay sensible stay safe so my journey into as you described wanting more from life now so for me so I'm you know I'm a uh, Asian person I'm British I'm Sikh I'm Punjabi and being that in the UK growing up there is an expectation and the expectation is to prosper and prosper academically. And that's very big in the, um, you know, the Sikh, definitely a Punjabi community. And that kind of meant for me growing up, right, you're gonna be a doctor, you're gonna be a lawyer, you're gonna be a dentist, pharmacist or engineer. Those are kind of the big five. And so probably from age, I'd say eight years old, when it was kind of in my, well, this is your life direction. I started getting to extra tuition outside of school, getting ready for the 11 plus. So, you know, that was the first time I was around like coaching and tuition and that got me into a grammar school. And then the folks at the grammar school was right, you need good GCSEs, you need good A-levels so you can kind of apply for medicine. So that happened as well. And then I went on to study medicine. And so age 23, I graduated as a doctor. Uh, and at that point, there was a sense, a big sense of completion, a big sense that we'd be reached. I'd reached, you know, the top of the hill, top of the mountain, you know, I was, I was the king. Uh, this is what... From age eight to 23, this was the sole focus. And probably naivety, definitely naivety, actually looking back at it now, there was a sense of, well, that's it. There's no more learning to be done in life now. And fulfillment is going to be inevitable. Happiness is going to be inevitable because I've done what I need to do. And so the first two years of working as what we call a junior doctor, you know, you get put through the paces. And, you know, because when you're a student, um, you can enjoy the interesting parts of medicine, but you can go home whenever you want. And then you start a job, essentially, and you have responsibility. You're there for service provision. You can't leave at certain times. You can't sometimes leave, you know, after for your contracted hours. So although we're there nine to five, patients often become unwell just before you're about to go home. And then they have to, uh, you know, be seen to. But that was fine. There was a sense of everybody goes through this. You know, this is just a rite of passage. And I got to I remember getting to age sort of 25 and then I'd become sort of more uh, sort of what we call a middle grade doctor. So it's time to enter some form of specialty. My interest is actually medicine. Um, so medicine is all the medical specialties. That's like heart and lung and kidney and that kind of thing. So not surgery and not GP, basically. And because you get more senior, you get more responsibility. Part of that is doing a lot more night shifts, long days, weekends. And that is grueling. Uh, and I definitely start to feel a sense of burnout and looking back at it now I started to become detached uh, from my patients and I call this emotional or empathy fatigue so the primary number one thing you expect or you want from a doctor is that you know they can empathize with you and communicate with you in an effective calm manner because some of the conversations we have on a regular basis it's not pleasant um, and there's no way of sugarcoating that thing so often I have to break bad news about that a scan has shown some cancer and things like that and there's you know there's no nice way of saying it but they as a patient you want to receive that in a sort of calm manner and somebody who understands and will explain thoroughly uh, and calmly the next steps 
I started to feel that actually I was um, sacrificing empathy for efficiency. And although I was getting better at my job and I can handle more emergencies and I can multitask and, you know, people were coming to me for advice, I was losing that kind of, why did I get into medicine? You know, this is a, this is a, um, it's all about human contact, human to human. And that's when I first started to look at it. I remember very vividly being on a night shift and uh, night shifts, if anybody works any sort of night shift, I think is the most inhumane uh, thing there. And my sister will commonly reminisce about, before I used to go on night shift and I'd be having my sort of dinner, I'd be at the table and I was really grumpy and moody and I'd be saying to her, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. This is it, I've had enough, you know? This is a common thing for me uh, on, that was the start of the night shift. And then the last night shift, I'll be like, yeah, I can see the end now. And I remember that it was one of those night shifts and I was sitting uh, in this empty corridor. It was really quiet. It's four o'clock in the morning. And I was just looking outside this big window. I'm just hoping, you know, and waiting for the sun to come up. And the sun was salvation. When you're on a night shift, you see that sun coming up. You see the day, day team coming in, the hospital getting busy. There's a buzz. You, it's just, a, you know, it's, it's nice to be around people. It's very lonely at nighttime. And I just thought, yeah, there has to be more to life. There just has to be more to life. And that's where the search began for me. It's almost like Neo in the Matrix when he's searching. He doesn't know what he's searching for. He wants to be found and he wants to find his tribe and he wants to find his calling, his purpose. These are the high level questions I was really asking. I didn't know at the time. So I started to Google, as you do. How old were you then? How old were you then? 25. 25. Yeah, yeah. So 23, graduated doctor, 25, had these two years and then started to think about these things. So I remember Googling <laughs> how to become a billionaire. That was, that was the term I actually said. <laughs> and went down a few rabbit holes. And actually, I stumbled upon this guy, Robert Kiyosaki. And he'd written this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which now as a property investor, I'm sure you've uh, read. Uh, and yeah. a lot of people in the personal development industry, it's one of those books that everybody's read. And I remember vividly getting a copy of this book. It's like secondhand, Amazon, three pounds. And my family and I were going to a little we were day tripping in London so we took the virgin train down and I was completely engrossed in this book and to this day uh, you know the clients that I coach it's one of the first books I get them to read and that famous phrase you know a job is the exchange of time for money when that hit me oh wow that was just like I was having so many light bulb moments being hit by lightning and I was like oh my god there's just so much out there I don't know and what the book this is the first what the book really did for me was it told me or exposed me to lots of things that could happen, but not the how. So the how, the execution wasn't there. But that then put me on the search for, well, how do I go and live a more authentic, um, purposeful life? Uh, and that's where the journey really, really began. And I delved into personal development and I started attending courses, seminars, reading books, uh, audio books as well, podcasts, loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff. Uh, and initially, and what I'd say to a lot of people is it's very fulfilling at the, at the start. You feel like you're getting a lot of knowledge and you're a sponge and you soak all this stuff up. But then there comes a point where too much knowledge is bad as well. And I definitely got to that saturated sort of point where I wasn't implementing the things I was reading or being taught. And so I sort of started to form this imposter syndrome where it's like, well, I, when I just have a bit more knowledge, you know, then I'll be ready to do something with it. And I, you know, I'm a big proponent of you to take massive action. And at that point, I wasn't taking it. So that's 25 and then 20. So this happened until about probably about 27. And then 27, I got married. Uh, and then after I got married, I took a step out of medical training in the sense of, so as a doctor, you can either be in training, working towards a sort of seniority, or you can take a step back and essentially become a contractor. So my kind of thinking at that point was, well, it's got married, first year married. You don't want to be constantly on night shifts. I want to spend time with my wife. I'm going to traveling. Let's become a contractor. Contract life is great, um, obviously a big need in the NHS, um, as it always is, uh, but it meant I could pick my hours, obviously pay was a lot better, um, an annual leave, so, you know, holidays. As a doctor, traditionally, you have nine days which you have to take every four months, uh, and you can't clump the days together. Whereas a contractor, it's just completely, you work when you want, whenever you want. Obviously, you're not being paid on those days, but the freedom was the thing, and to all those people who are self-employed in uh, contracting, it's very hard once you see that lifestyle to go back. And I, I'm still a contractor and I can't see myself coming back to being a sort of full-time employee. And that allowed me the time outside of the fun stuff I was doing uh, to set up a few businesses. So I uh, went into medical teaching. So now I have a medical teaching company. We just ran a course yesterday, actually two days uh, for our students to get ready for exams. 
so that's prospering nicely that allows me to teach the you know the beautiful side of medicine and empower the you know the young guys coming through so they have a more fruitful experience i also had an aesthetics business um so that was uh, sort of botox and fillers and things um i actually sold that yeah i sold that during lockdown though um so i no longer do that anymore as you mentioned i have a uh, coaching company so it's around mindset coaching and getting people to live authentic purpose-driven lives and those people are really stuck in a rut don't know where to go and how to get there and really just to understand who they are and show them the path of deep introspection to understand themselves to understand their values and really set um, you know, their vision and mission and the property as you mentioned yes that's a uh, something i advise all people to do and uh, not be reliable on one source of income Although it is a lot of work, so you need to know what you're doing. Um, and that's kind of where I am today. It's uh, My time is really split between work, still working as a doctor on the front line. So I've got three, four days a week. Um, and the beauty is when I'm there, I'm just there. I don't, I'm not thinking about anything else. When I'm not there, I'm not there. Though. And so that time is my own. And I'm working on the property side of things, the coaching side of things, and uh, running medical courses. courses. So that's I didn't know you, I, yeah, I didn't know you did the medical courses as well. So how... So is that, how do you get those students to you? Are they paying to see you? Is that how it works? Yeah. As in what you mean with respect to marketing? Is that what you mean? Or... Yeah, I mean, are you, do you, do you come across these students in the hospital you work at or is it bigger than that? Oh, I see, okay. So when we started a medical company, a teaching company, we had to decide to focus on either the undergraduates or postgraduates. Now, from a financial point of view, there's obviously more money to be made in the postgraduate market, so qualified doctors and qualified uh, other sort of medical professionals. But actually, our passion at that point was working with students, which is definitely more challenging because, as you know, students don't have any money. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what we wanted to do is create sort of, you know, accessible uh, packages and products which students could really use that not only get them through exams, but really serve them as they come into working life. So. Initially, we started very locally, as you said. The first three students we took through our trainings, that was back in 2017, were essentially three people that were working with me in the hospital. So they were kind of you know, the, the testing phase. And now we operate in a way where our front end, uh, when we get students, is essentially we offer them uh, free teaching. So it's a sort of a taster session. Uh, on the back end of that, um, they'll sign up to the course if they feel compelled. So yesterday we had 20 students that attended from various different universities uh, traveling to Birmingham uh, and that's how we operate. Now the focus going into this year is we have a couple of new markets which are postgraduate markets. So where I work again at the moment we have a lot of foreign doctors coming in. So Nepal, India, Pakistan, uh, China and what I found is uh, although medically they're very gifted and they have the same medical knowledge as I would have, obviously the NHS is a different beast altogether. It's a different healthcare system and the you know the cultural aspects of working in the UK you know, uh, things like banter aren't things that are, are taught uh, to these guys in their uh, medical induction, which are very uh, sort of shoddy. So we've now created a product which will help serve these guys to integrate well into the NHS. So we're always looking for these pain points uh, and these things that doctors really need that there isn't a uh, sort of solution for, uh, and then going and creating them. That's where, that's where I have the most fun. It's just problem solving uh, and then the delivery of that information. Oh, okay, that sounds, that sounds really good. Um, so, so you were sort of 25 mm. and it took you to 27 to start taking action. And okay. I mean, that's, I mean, that's fairly typical, isn't it? I mean, you know, lots of people procrastinate. I still procrastinate now at the ripe old age of 47. So, uh, um, but I, I know that something happened, I think more recently for you as well, you know, in terms of you had a bit of a, I don't know whether it was a breakdown or, or not, but you had, this, you had a, a, a mental anxiety, was it? Was it anxiety? Absolutely. Went through? Absolutely. Yeah, and what, yeah. what so, brought that on? So uh, let's take it a bit more recent then. So we have the lockdown, which came March, 2020. And just prior to that, so the prior year, June, July, 2019, essentially I was in a very good contracting role in the, in the NHS. And, Obviously, as a contractor, sometimes uh, powers above want to clamp down uh, and they basically said, Jazz, you know, you're very good at what you do, but we can't afford you anymore. So at that point, I thought, OK, maybe it's time for a different direction. And so 
I started doing some other work, so non-hospital work. So I started a job where it's essentially uh, doing medical assessments for those people who qualify for benefits. So it's called a disability analysis or disability assessor. And so they typically use people who are medically trained, nurses, doctors, physiotherapists. And looking at it objectively, I was like, well, because the strategy I had in my head was, well, okay, I'll take a sort of what looked like a simple job um, so that my outside of the job hours, I can just focus purely on the business side of things. So that was the kind of thinking I had. And I went into this role. And the, what I found in the role is that you needed to conform 100%, that there was no autonomy in this role. They, were, they didn't value creativity. Uh, and there was no sort of um, no sense of being part of a team. You were very isolated. So literally, I'd sit in a room, and claimants that's what we call them claimants would come in and you'd assess them for disability. And although, even if I came to the right uh, outcome, so the level of disability, if the report wasn't written in a specific way, because in the initial phase, all your work is audited and you need to, you're in this sort of um, period where you're essentially being, everything's been audited. And if you pass that, you then allowed to not be audited all the time and I was um, you know although I was getting to the right things they were just saying no no this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong and he challenged them but it wouldn't go anywhere and then you'd have conversations with other people and they had the same frustrations and I was like well you know why are you still here and they're like well you know you just have to if you're going to stay here you have to conform and actually in that period I realized how good it was to be a doctor because obviously at the end, when I left that, I thought, oh no, this is burning me out, but the fatigue and oh, this will be easy, I'll take on this government role, this will be fine. And I remember reading a book actually um, during lockdown by Martin Gladwell, it's called Outliers. And in there, he has this really good uh, framing around meaningful work. And he says, for any work to be meaningful, you need three things, and that's autonomy. There needs to be um, creativity. So there's always an element of problem solving, nothing's always the same. And there has to be an, a relationship between effort and reward. I look back at that role and it didn't have any three, it didn't have any of those elements. And essentially what happened to me was I was I was thinking constantly, I'm, you know, like you said, I'm an entrepreneur, I have all these things, and all the people working at this job don't do any of these things. How is it they're able to do it? I'm not able to do this what looks as a simple role. And I think that's where the anxiety start to build. It was that was the was the issue, and I think initially I didn't I didn't think um, you know I had anxiety, and whilst I was doing that, um, I still had the other things that were going on, and this when I still had the aesthetics uh, stuff as well. I just there was a, a period of forty five days where I just didn't have a day off. Um, so it was courses, uh, aesthetic clinics, calls, business, and then and this Monday to Friday normal stuff that I was doing for this new job. Uh, and it got to the point where I think I was drinking two cups of coffee a day. I was waking up with anxiety, palpitations, waking up without the alarm clock, uh, you know, scared to go to work, diarrhea, um, coming back and just feeling safe, uh, you know, just being in my house, uh, being with my wife. And then, the, you know, the cycle repeating again. And I remember the day where essentially they, it got to the point where they basically said, well, if you don't meet this thing, then we're going to have to ask you to leave. That's kind of what it was. And I said, well, I'm highly skilled. I'm a doctor. I've got these things. I don't really need this. And I was like, well, okay, so I'll, I'll resign them. And I kind of made that in my head. And I remember walking out my last day, knowing that I'm never going to walk back into this building. And that was, that was pretty liberating, that feeling. Mm. Um, the fallacy was that I thought, okay, just because I've left it, the anxiety will just, that'll drop as well. And it didn't, and it still lingered. And so I realized, okay, I need to do a bit of work here to really um, understand what is it about this that has led me to this and understanding that it's it's okay. And the other part was, that, you know, I often said to my wife, it's like, how can this happen to me? You know, I'm supposed to be a superstar. People look at me like a jazz is smashing it. Like, you know, I'm not supposed to have this. I'm, you know, and now I'm in a position where I, I, um, actively uh, will say to people, it's not that some people have mental health problems, some people don't. Everybody is on the spectrum. Uh, and in our lives, there are spikes of chaos, which will culminate in you know, physical symptoms or blowouts or you know meltdowns or burnout. Uh, and what I realized now, so in that period after that, so the story after that is I actually did come back into the NHS and that was just before the lockdown. And I felt this uh, calling, this, um, 
I'm here to serve. I have a skill set. I need to go and you know be who I'm meant to be. But the framing is different, you know. So I viewed the work I did in, in medicine completely differently. I was there to help people from a very holistic point of view, and I had new skills now with the coaching element, and not just really trying to give people band aids, but really trying to help them with the underlying problems and causing not just you know focusing on just take a tablet and that kind of instant gratification. Uh, and I understood that in the same way we exercise in the gym to stay fit. There needs to be bicep curls for the brain. Uh, and that's when I reinvigorate my passion for meditation. I've taken up yoga since uh, lockdown last year. That's thanks to my mom. Got a yoga session today. So I always look forward to my yoga now. Uh, mindfulness now. So all these things on the days you feel good still need to be invested in because when the inevitable chaos comes, do you have the skill sets? Do you have the arc which can navigate that storm which will come in all our lives. And that's what I've learned. And there are days where, you know, the anxiety still creeps in and I, but I'm aware now, this is the difference. I can, I can see it, I can feel it coming. And then I have the tools to say, well, why are you there? I can see that you're there, but there's no reason for you to be there. And I can address it from time rather than just letting it manifest in the body and feeling sort of out of sorts. So yeah, that was the, um, that was the story. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of people, you know, suffer with anxiety and, mm. I think, you know, me just listening to you, because I, I didn't realise how all that sort of started. Um, mm. And you think, well, you're a doctor. How are you getting, you know what I mean? Because you've got like <laughs> yeah. this, you've got this awareness. Aura. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you've got this knowledge, you've got the awareness, you know, you you probably see people with anxiety all the time as well. And mm. And it's like, how does a doctor get it? But of course, you're just human like everyone else, aren't you? How does the doctor get it? And how does the doctor not know when he's got it? That was the other thing. <laughs> uh, and then, and like you said, it's a good point. Although, so before this, you know, I'd see people with anxiety, but I hadn't, I couldn't empathize with them. As much as I could say, like, I understand what you're going through. It wasn't really coming from a real place. But now when I see it, you know, I had, I had a student yesterday. You know, she got really, really anxious about the exam. And I just, you know, if you open up and you become vulnerable yourself, it allows that person to do the same. I just shared my thing. I said, it's okay. It does happen. It's happened to me very recently. I'm at a point where I was just, I thought, was smashing life, you know. Um, but absolutely, you're right. Everybody, we are all human. Uh, and that's the thing. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I mean, I, I try, I'm one of these people that I never really suffered with depression, you know. Mm. Yeah, I have my down days, but you wouldn't call it depression. Um, and a bit like you, I I can't relate to people when they are, you know, in that state or they've, you know, and, and then they need to take the tablets. You know, I know mm. friends of mine are, are taking tablets right now because, well, they're going through the menopause as well, which has really accelerated things, in, you know, in terms of their mental health. Mm -hmm. um and even my partner you know he was taking tablets a couple of years ago uh, mm -hmm. no he stopped taking them just before probably only about eight months ago um now he's got a very he he did have a very stressful job it's it still is stressful but it's different now while everybody's working from home mm -hmm. um and i struggle to relate to it I, I, because I've not been in that situation and I and I do think if I ever got to that situation I wouldn't want to take the tablets but until mm. you're in it you don't know do you so absolutely yeah um okay so in terms of um how old are you now Jazz by the way 30 30 three zero yeah um so so okay so if in three years then you've done all of that the property the the businesses the coaching mm. that's pretty mm. that's pretty amazing so basically <laughs> you've got a rocket up your ass and you went for it yeah but as, as you know when you start businesses there's not much to do so <laughs> i started a lot of them at the same time and then as they actually start demanding time off you and they start growing then actually like oh bloody hell i'm actually now really really spread uh, and that was one of the reasons why i actually left the aesthetics and uh, one of my mentors, he's a, he's a sort of genius when it comes to marketing. He's somebody I um, who says he's got a public speaking company. And although he doesn't teach the public speaking, he's the CEO and I'd have good conversations with him. And I remember approaching him about, can you do the marketing for the aesthetics? Um, because as you'll know, it's all about, you know, the right ads, the right ad copy, the creative, and you can get people through the door. And that's not in itself 
and he does it very well for public speaking. And initially he, he agreed to do it and I was really psyched because you know, this is the guy. Uh, and then I remember him calling me and saying, you know, look, I don't, I'm not going to do it. And the reason he gave me was he said, I don't want to live in a world where my here sister, he said, my sister has to feel like she has to conform to certain sort of facial things. She goes, he said, if, imagine in a world where if everybody gets it, so everybody looks, uh, has a certain look, then the people who don't, well, they'll, they'll be the minority and they'll start feeling they need to conform. And at the time it was a bit like, oh man, no, 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 you know, we don't, we don't do that. And most of our clientele are elderly people and, you know, we're offering them Botox just to help the wrinkles. It's not that we're trying to completely remake their faces. And then lockdown came and our clinic was closed anyway. And I had this, the journey that we went on uh, with the UCU and the deep introspection. And I started to think about it and that, that, that came back again, the thing he'd said. And I, I thought, yeah, this doesn't align. This work doesn't align with my values. But prior to that, I didn't have awareness. The values are always there, but I didn't have awareness of my values and where the best use of my time and energy is. And then it became very clear. I said, this doesn't align. Um, I'm not passionate about this. Whereas helping people, the vehicles to help people for me are the medical teaching, it's the coaching and being in hospital. Those align with what my values are and allow me to manifest my vision, whereas aesthetics really wasn't. But I'm happy in the sense that I have no regret. So when we got into aesthetics, there was a reason. Now that I've left it, I don't look back at it. People come up to me and they, they want advice about getting into it. I'm very honest about, look, if you want to make money, this is how you can do it. It's fine. But it's the, you know, it doesn't align with my higher calling. Um, and so dropping that was good because then it allowed me to focus time and energy. And, you know, there is this concept, as you know, in entrepreneurs, a shiny penny syndrome, and you can look at everything and try and be in Forex and trading and this and this and this. And although I like to learn, I think until you get things to a good level, um, and again, one of my other mentors, one of my life coaches, he had this really good thing where he said, try and add one revenue stream per year. And he said, just put, give, give it a year. And, you know, this guy, he said he's been doing it 16 years. He's got 16 revenue streams. And I thought, that's really good. And actually, to that end, you know, this year for me, when I look at the coaching that we both uh, offer for UCU, for me, it's to generate a self-sustaining uh, funnel, uh, which is sustainable, which allows me to bring in um clients and then to help them through this journey that's my focus for this year with respect to coaching with respect to property and uh, like i said we're going to pivot our strategy now and focus on, focus on social housing and so it's to get five more uh, sort of property deals with that strategy and then with the medical teaching we've got two new courses which we want to launch to the postgraduate market and that's it i'm not looking to take on any more you know people coming to me they want jv and I remember actually when I when we went through that work and when you uncover your values, somebody came up to me and said, "Oh, jazz, like you know, uh, on a Friday night when people get pissed, you know, we could have a little van there and we could put a candle in and give them IV fluids and hydrate them." Now, this is something that does happen in like London and big things to avoid obviously the headaches and things. And you know, it's very easy work, but it was so easy for me to say no. It's like no, it doesn't align with my values. Um, and I love that now, the, the power to say no, but with the conviction of knowing why you say no and not the FOMO is gone, you know, the fear of missing out. I don't have that with these things. Uh, and the things that I'm working on, uh, which are meaningful, they, they do take time. And that's the thing. I think I was naive in the sense that for me, especially, and I, I don't know if you, if you watch Only Fools and Horses. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, you know, Dubois phrase it was like, you know, this time next year, we're going to be millionaires. Yeah. So I had expectation of myself. I didn't realize this until I actually got really close to 30, that by 30, you know, 30 seems to be this number where you need to have life figured out. You need to know who you go, who you are, where you go. You need to be a millionaire and all these things. And 30 came and it just all sort of fizzled away. And now I'm not 30, well, I am 30, but I'm uh, approaching 31 and I don't feel that sense anymore. It's, and somebody really good, I, don't, I can't remember who it was, said that, well, if you figure out life by 30, what would the rest of your life you know, be for? So the, you know, the journey definitely is the goal. Uh, rather than uh, you know being this tangible endpoint and to continuously work on that and just slow things down so I'm able to give my attention to the time that I have and for me that definition of what success looks like now is simply time and choice and freedom and if I have those things I'm winning yeah absolutely I mean you, you've just answered what I was going to ask you because I was going to say what what does this you know what does the next year mm. look like for you well you've, you've just basically answered that um, and the other thing I wanted to ask you was since mm. since going through this work, so the work we're talking about here is uncovering your core values, which allows you to um, create your vision and 
and your mission in terms of how you can create that vision. And that is, you know, hugely powerful for anyone to do. Mm. How has it changed or has it changed? I imagine there's been some changes, your relationship with your wife, you know, when you went through that process, has it changed things for you on a, on a personal front with, with your relationship? Absolutely. So my wife actually did the UCU before me. And so she was the actual, the hook. So she actually found so our mentor, Dino. Yeah. Uh, and I often, you know, I laugh about it with him. She showed me the picture of this dude, you know, with long curly hair and these glasses and look a bit like Jesus. And, you know, he's doing this coaching work. And uh, I remember her going through the process uh, and she was lost at the point where she found Dino. And I saw her grow and mature. And when she came out the other side, she was just confident woman you know she had this fire she had the spark she was a beast and I was like wow it's like okay this is pretty inspiring stuff and often what I tell my friends uh, you know who are married or in a relationship I said that, you know there's nothing more invigorating than when you see your partner turn it up because you know you just want to step up your level as well you it's you're sort of it's it's really good healthy competition but you want to um you want a worthy adversary put it that way and when she upped yeah, so this is this is really good. And so when I went through the work, because she understands the work, now in our room we have the two sort of printed plaques which have our values, our diamonds, our mission, our vision. And each morning we'll look at them, uh, and it will take some time each day or at least in the week to look and reflect and say, well, okay, how are we meeting this? And I'd say what it's given me is a framework through which to see things. And when we are sitting down together and making sort of life plans we're so aligned in what we want and you know it's my wife isn't the person who wants Louis Vuitton handbags uh, and this and this and this you know she's very much of the same opinion it's you wake up on a Monday morning look at each other and say what do you want to do today that's success that's freedom it's when we have kids you know we're the parents that can go to sports days go to the plays pick our kids up from school drop them off that's success it's waking up each morning and being able to kiss your wife properly before you go to work that is success yeah. and that's it. So I'd say we're very aligned, although our values are slightly different, but they're complementary. Um, and it's that sovereignty of, because, because she's been through the work, I don't feel the need to, I don't need permission from anybody else. People who understand, you know, if you know, you know, and I know you're one of those people, the people that are close to me, my best friends, they understand this work. And actually I'm taking one of my best friends through this uh, process now. I don't feel the need to explain to anybody else. It's just to live and shine as you know, you can. And, slowly slowly people will understand and they'll become awake and once the awareness starts for them i think that's the point those who are ready to start this path of awareness and introspection they will resonate with the message if you're not it's fine but i'm not there to preach and um sort of convert people into this way of thinking i tried that in the early days when i think that's another thing entrepreneurs do when they get certain knowledge you just want to tell everybody and it's coming from a good place but certain people just aren't ready to accept yeah. that knowledge and they hit back and then you then you feel a bit confused about or maybe I'm not right with what I'm thinking. Um, so now I just I kind of just do my own thing uh, and I just try and be around good people, have interesting conversations. Um, and, and that's it, I try and fill my life with interesting conversations. Yeah. That's the beauty of life, yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I was, I was very similar to you um, when I was in my sort of late 20s, 30s, and that's when I got into property and stuff and, and I was oh. gonna be a millionaire and all the rest of it. And um, and then, I mean, I, I, I went through some hard times. I almost went bankrupt at one point um, because I decided to invest in Spain just before the crash in right. 2007. So it was not, it, yeah, it was not pretty at all. Um, and I think after that, you know, I, I had a lot of reflecting um, and realized yeah. that, because we're all, we're all, like rushing for this end goal like you say and it's it's a load of rubbish because what is mm. what is the end goal if you ever got to an end goal well, well now what um <clears throat> and it's the journey you know and you hear a lot of like sort of rock stars and actors you know famous actors say it was more fun getting there than it is being here you know and and I think mm. we should all take stock of that you know we should be enjoying the moment every every day we shouldn't just be thinking Oh, but in six months, oh, in 12 months, you know, in five years, life's here right now, isn't it? That's what we should be doing, just enjoying what's here right now. Um, and yes, we have aspirations and yes, we do need some sort of goals to, to a level, but I don't, mm. you know, some people run their life by it and, and are missing the moment, they're missing life. 
Absolutely. Um, Tony has a great phrase, which I tell all my coaches, it's progress equals happiness. And that's it. And he says the most unhappy thing is reaching a goal and being unfulfilled. And so uh, little wins, small wins every day in all aspects of your life, relationship, income, finance, spirituality, health. You know, it has to be a balance of all these things. Mm. It's these small things where you actually feel alive. And a lot of my early stuff when I used to coach used to be like, guys, it's about, you know, time. Time is the asset and create time. What I've learned now is time creation is important. Time freedom is important. But once you have created the time, can you give attention to the time you have? Or is it that when you're there, you're just thinking about, like you said, when this happens, then I'll be happy. You know, that's the phrase I hear all the time. And that book that we had to read in our uh, preparation, Victor Frankl, happiness cannot be pursued. It can simply be ensued. Happiness is the byproduct of being, doing something meaningful. Uh, and that's things like that make it really, really uh, clear for me that I actually love what you do. And, you know, if you understand your ikigai, your reason to be, and you go and live into that, uh, you know, irrespective of what other people think, uh, then ultimately happiness is going to come as a byproduct. But uh, absolutely, progress. It's the progress which is the key rather yeah. than actually attaining certain things. Because once you get there, you're going to want more. Um, and then that's a different discussion about, well, you know, what's the point of contentment? Is that what you're aiming for? Can you get to a place where you're content and actually happy with what you have? Just yesterday, I watched this great, great uh, documentary. I get to watch it as well. Um, so Joe Rogan did a podcast, an old podcast I was listening to, and he talked about this guy called Haimo. Maybe. So Haimo is this guy who's lived in uh, Alaska for the last 40 years, lived there with his wife. Uh, basically, you know, he's just cut from the outside world and he just sees a hunter-gatherer. He lives in this log cabin and he does his thing and each day is about being with nature and, you know, finding food and and he's happy. You know, the, the documentary is basically, and he's not like this weirdo, like, you, know, you listen to him, he's very articulate and he has opinions and views and he understands things but he chooses to live this way uh, and he's not sort of trapped by the Dalai Lama talks about how we've built these prisons for ourselves yeah. these bills you know we have a mortgage we have electricity we have this we have this car expenses these are the prisons that we've built and then we you know, live our lives to earn money to pay these bills uh, and just get stuck in this rat race or you know this hamster wheel that we call it and it's just the thing that get the thing that gets to me is when I look at people especially in the NHS and it's like well so you're working for the next four years, okay? So, and because your end game is you're going to retire and have a pension, that's the end game. There's no guarantee when you get to that point, you're going to have the health or the wealth to live the life you want to live, you know, this golden era of time. So you need to live now. And a big proponent for me when I started thinking about that was this concept of frugality. Uh, and for the listeners, being frugal is not the same as being cheap. Being frugal is understanding what's meaningful to you and you alone and investing your time and income on things that you enjoy and not conforming. So, you know, look, if you, and to that end, look, if you really like designer t-shirts, that's fine. Buy them because you like them, not because you society expects you to look a certain way for signs of, you know, affluence or wealth. But at the same time, like for me now, um, the things I enjoy doing, they're not particularly expensive. Um, and, but I enjoy them. Uh, that's what's important to me. So I don't need these outward signs of sort of wealth and affluence, these, you know, the sense of hoarding and having. And the the mantra I, I always ask my coaching clients, or the question I ask my coaching clients is, do you want to have more? Do you want to do more? Or do you want to be more? And you can have all three. It's fine. Because even with the having, you know, having good quality sum with your family is a good thing. But uh, if it's just materialistic or consumeristic, then actually there's no end to that. That hunger will never end. But if you want to do more, like have more meaningful experiences, when you look back at life and you think, that's all it is, is a collection of, your life is a collection of memories. Uh, and when I'm there at 90, you can have a million pounds in your bank, which is not going to go with you. Or you could look back and think about all the meaningful experiences and the lives you impacted when you were here. And being more, you know, can, can you show up and be the light and be the beacon for other people uh, so they understand? So that's why I think this you know, thing about mental health is certain people will have a perception about me when they look at the things I do. And when I bring when I bring this story in, it's an extra level of vulnerability. And again, it allows other people to feel like this is okay. All humans have the same problems. This is the thing. And I have this thing I often try and describe to people that imagine being in a room where nobody's speaking. If you could just look at what everyone was thinking, where well, we all have the same problems. But we think we're isolated and we think it's just affecting me. And as soon as one person talks about it, the other person realizes oh, it's okay to share. And then that's where we build uh, real connections and real rapport. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> 
Thank you. That was lovely. Um, <clears throat> well, I think what I always, as I bring these interviews to a close, I always ask mm -hmm. um, my guests if there was one thing that you could speak to to the listeners if they're maybe currently unhappy in their own life in whatever that means for them or if they're feeling a bit trapped or a bit stuck or or you know when you had that moment looking out the window at 4 a.m and you started to realize you wanted different what if you could give one little pearl of wisdom or anything anything that comes to mind what what would you like to say Sorry for putting you on the spot. I know it's good. I'm trying to get very succinct. Um, one pill, maybe too <laughs> big a test. What I would say is, look, if you want, if you want to go and find success and happiness, then for me, the three things have been great knowledge, great habits, great mentors, and understanding that look, knowledge is fine, but embodied knowledge is wisdom. So take what you have and go and test it and see what feedback you get. That's the first thing. Don't be scared to fail. Change the perception of failure. Failure is instant feedback. Fail, the reason why we have such a bad connotation with failure is because in school, if you fail, it's seen as a bad thing. In the real world, you know, I'll test something new in the business. If, if it really works, if the students like it, they'll tell me. If they don't, they tell me. I know straight away, change it. So it's, it's brilliant. You know, failure is instant feedback. Habits. So I always say motivation is like an espresso that will wear off. You need discipline to carry through the long term. And the only thing that gets carried through is if you have good habits, things that are still programmed into you. But when you're forming a new habit, you need to decrease the barriers to do something. If you say, if you start telling yourself, I'm going to eat, I don't know, five apples a day, you're just never going to do it. You're not going to be able to sustain it. Start with, I'm going to have one slice of an apple today. And that's it. And you've got that, you've won. And this small incremental growth with compounded over time will give you great success, but reduce the barriers to doing these new things. And number three, great mentors. You know, the people I hang around with, hang around with now are generally 20, 30 years older than me because what I value is their experience, what they feel from their wisdom. Get around people who inspire you, get around people who are, have the things or doing things that you want to do. And honestly, just humble yourself uh, and get mentored by them. You know, in my life now, I have six, seven mentors. Whatever level that is, is great, but I actually, I realized to get to the you know, higher levels, I need to be around people who are really doing it. And for me, that's, you know, business coaching, life coaching, spiritual coaching, golf coaching, learning new language. My wife is my coach. <laughs> so you have all these things and just be around people and listen to understand. This is a big thing. Uh, and as Socrates used to say, people ask me, what do you know? And he'd simply say, I only know what I don't know. And always be, um, I think Steve Jobs had this great line, stay, stay foolish stay um stay foolish stay hungry and just just be inquisitive be curious uh, in situations and that will take you far but just get around the right people get mentored yeah. that's my number one thing get around the right people the right people mm. wonderful thank you so much jazz thanks for your time this morning it's been a, a privilege to, to share this space with you and um i know you're going to do incredibly well in everything you do and i i wish you very well thank you very much Thank you once again, Mel. Thank you for the opportunity today. No problem.